Months of work, of sleepless nights, perfecting each detail. Engine checks and practice flights through winter storms and hail. Now the time has come. There are secrets my city is yearning to know. And the time has come to uncover the answers concealed in the snow. And from this moment forward, there's no turn. I've never been more ready to go. We're off on a journey, a grand expedition. Amidst all the dangers that might lie in store, a precarious climb to the top of the world where no one has gone before. Hope, my dear, you never fail to triumph. And impress. The advisory board is completely astounded by the work you've done on this ship. Our craft's been cleared, we'll soon set sail. We're sure to find success. If mother were here to see her daughter following in her footsteps, nothing would make her happier. Now the time has come to further the work of her proud legacy. And, and the, the time, time has come to rewind the fight that she fought me to be. And from this Moment forward, there's no turning back as our visions come to reality. We're off on a journey, a stunning adventure that's full of new wonders we've yet to explore. It's a breathtaking quest to the top of the world where no one has gone before. My goodness, what a magnificent creation! A work of John, you've outdone yourself. Uh, Madame Capito, I'm glad you find the Vita Nova to your liking, but I must admit, the credit doesn't belong to me. May I introduce Hope Goodwell? She's been the chief engineer on this project from the beginning. We are extremely grateful that you showed such an interest in this mission. None of this would be possible if it weren't for your generous contributions. Oh, please, when I heard of your plan, I knew I had to do my part to get it on its feet. What's there to gain if we lie about while our city laments without proper command? What's there to gain from another day of ignoring the problem at hand? The future of Avant is at stake. The situation is in land that we must watch for our sake. And as it happens, the sacrifice is one I am willing to make. Allow me to say how delighted we are to have you on board. Sean, the pleasure is all mine. After all, what's there to gain from a sheltered life while my husband lived out every whim? Across the world he would roam and he'd leave me at home. So this time I'll travel for him. Oh, drop those long faces, there's work to be started and so grim. Hope, be a dear and show us to our quarters. Complete any task they give you quickly and quietly, and don't draw any unnecessary attention to yourself. Ariana, are you listening to me? I... yes, but I'm just so excited. Up past the clouds, I know he is there in the chill of the Told you I don't want you speaking of lights mentioning father saying your prayers. Ambrose! All those ancient stories you hold to, they're not welcome here in Avance. Don't let them know that you are his daughter, nobody cares. They hated him for who he was and what he believed, and they hate us just the same. And finally, I found a way for both of us to leave. Behind the heartache and the shame So we're off on a journey, we're facing the future There's no need to live in the past anymore They can never know who we are And they can never know who Father was It's a chance to escape To the top of the world Now the time has come To finish the world
everyone. Welcome to today's Cyber Teen Variety Show of Sleepless Nights, hosted by myself and George Luton. This way. Um, <laughs> um, we are so excited to be here and want to say a huge thank you to the Tank NYC for giving us this platform to showcase some of our sleep deprived projects, otherwise known as our original works of musical theater. Um, so, George, do you want to? This way again. Do you want to tell everyone about the first number we just saw? Yeah, so we just heard the opening number from The Northern Skies, which is a musical that Emily and I created that's about this expedition to the Arctic Circle um, that uh, to, to save to save a city from environmental catastrophe. Um, so in that uh, in that number where no one has gone before, we just sort of met the members of the very motley crew. Um, and uh, yeah, so so we're gonna we're gonna in our in our next segment we're gonna we're gonna have three songs from the Northern Skies, but we're gonna skip ahead to Act Two to get at some of the drama, the uh, the, the the family conflict, the murder, all the good stuff. So um yeah, is that is that about what we need to open with Emily? Yeah. All right, we're good. Let's call it. This is, this is I wish I had the words from the Northern Skies. Uh, 
<laughs> it's so pretty. <laughs> it's a favorite. Oh my gosh, George's orchestration, it's so gorgeous and it's huge. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's an entirely digital orchestra. If anyone's curious, it's built entirely out of software instruments. So to like create something like that out of nothing, um, I would usually like lay down a MIDI piano track through a key station, which sort of provides a basis for the rest of the demo. Uh, it outlines like on a large scale, like key and tempo and in sort of on a smaller level, it's like harmonic structure and rhythm. So once you have a keyboard part in place, you can sort of build around it, um, layering on synthetic voices and you, and you double and redistribute the musical lines. Um, and, oh, and also you sort of write new parts that are specific to the instruments you have. So I think my, my, my digital trumpet patch is, is pretty good. Um, the strings are a little janky. So uh, it's, it, you can kind of um, work with what you got to try to make the sound full and, and nice. I mean, I'm still, still figuring out how to, how to do it properly. So we're experimenting here. Um, and also for music that has been part of a, a theatrical production that's, that's had a band uh, present, um, I like the Northern Skies. I've already created an orchestration for live use. So it's particularly helpful as a reference part for creating these kinds of tracks. Yeah, so um, the next song is our final song from the Northern Skies, um, and it is the 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 villain's number, um, Madame Capito. Emily played her beautifully in the opening, and now she's going to sing um, her about her wicked deeds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is, a, this is a, let, let this be a lesson. And you have grown close Have you thought about how this might end? Well, maybe it's time that I give you a dose of reality He's not your friend Let this be a lesson All power comes at a price It's a tireless uphill climb let this be a lesson on what you must sacrifice I promise you'll learn in time To get what you want You must harden your heart And guard each emotion with care All feelings of fondness will tear you apart And they'll leave you with naught but despair Let this be a lesson there's no one who doesn't cheat For the world runs on treacherous lies Let this be a lesson All friendship is just deceit All kindness a neat disguise Heed what we discussed And limit your trust Then so that I must advise Let this be a lesson You must open your eyes They take traveling alone Friendless and frightened and so far from home If you've got to know them better Find out who they are and whether they're on our side If they'll make it back alive You have the task that should they unmask The secretive past they hide You'll remember with whom your loyalty lies But for now, Valer, be wary Be a lesson, the world knows not wrong from right. What is it this time? There's surely not more matters of business. Let this be a lesson, there are times to put up a fight. You're only ever thinking of yourself. Useless people are a burden, you'll be trapped unless you're certain who's on. have more than we need. I don't care what people might pay for this recherche. You have to understand that mining these grounds might devastate them. What do you know? You're just weak and afraid, Lisa. and if you're going to stand in my way, I'll- Enough! The matter is closed. Trust in me. I know what's best. What's there to gain if I stay at home? 
wasting talent and guile while I'm left on the shelf. What's there to gain from a selfish man who controls all we own by himself? It's sad, but it's true how the world isn't fair. A misfortune I learned long ago. And steeped disappointment has left me aware of the hideous lengths we must go. more worthless life. It's time you learn that no one will stand in my way. Wow. All right. <laughs> um, so I, that that's it for the Northern Skies. I was actually just thinking about how I was going to try to talk less, um, but I did forget to say something, unfortunately, and that was that the voice of, of Capito's husband, the Monsieur, was not actually me. It was Rafe Gillum, the one and only, the extremely talented. So thank you, Rafe, for contributing your beautiful, beautiful voice. And um, yeah, that's that's now it's now it's all Emily. She's gonna talk about the next show. Take me <laughs> We'll take him back in with you. Okay, so the next number is from a work in development of ours. Um, it's called Miss March, and it's exploring the untold story of the family behind Little Women, the Alcott family. Um, and this number that you're about to see kind of introduces the the central conflict, um, at least the first central conflict, um, which is uh, Louis C. Alcott is writing uh, the sequel to Little Women, Good Wives, um, and her publishers insist that Joe must marry, um, contrary to what she wants to do. So we have coming up a defense of spinsterhood, um, not only from Louis C. Alcott in 1868, but of Abigail uh, May, uh, Louise's mother um, in the past, as well as Joe and Miss Norton in the fictional Good Wives, Little Women, Part Two, uh, and so it's a it's a it's a fun quartet, lots of stuff going on, and we're gonna see a bit of it now. Dear Miss Alcott, I applaud the speed at which you produced the sequel and find it splendid, save one small detail. Roberts Brothers cannot support your decision to have Jill remain in New York unmarried. And I must insist that all the marches are wed by the final page. Joe Mary? Why can't that foolish man say she's different? He may think that I will acquiesce, but I won't give up so quickly. For Joe, I'll keep on fighting. I can't allow rewriting. I won't be swayed by a head so thick. What a pity. What a shame. How could he trick me into believing he's different? He's no better. Than the other men just seeking a hand to wed. If my mind won't be respected, I'm glad I've been rejected. I might as well suspect it. All that he said was just a game. What a pity. What a shame. Only to be a wife. That's not what I had in mind. That's not what I've There's had so in much mind. more that I've said. Out. There's so much more she could make of herself. I shall find my way and start anew. Why should I marry? My heart's already full from the 
pleasures in my life. How many times must I explain I have dreams and plans that would disappear for good. I a wife, were she a wife, and so a spinster. have a thrilling time. Oh, we always do. Every evening proves more exquisite than the last. Thanks to you, of course. When I first came to this city, I thought I'd be alone. I feared I would return to Concord. So much left undone. But with every passing day, I grow more certain. with me transports us to a fantasy from galleries to music halls i cherish all our nightly calls i never guessed that i'd have so much fun it's delightful just to share it with someone i fear it will seem so dull when i go out once we have parted ways why would i ever leave Perhaps you'll want to return to Concord? And do what? I don't know. Find a husband? Start a family? I find it highly unlikely. I already know that's not how I'll spend my days. Why should I marry? My heart's already full from the pleasures in my life. A brand new joy I can't explain. You'll have to. Once everyone finds out that you're different, they will never comprehend the strange decision was all your own. They'll think you're a wilted flower, growing gross and sour, and question every hour why you're alone as they exclaim, what a pity, what a shame. But that's only misconception. For I won't be alone I'll stay right at your side That is, as long as I'm allowed Because I have no inclination towards marriage To live aside you as a spinster I'd be proud Be careful with all these proclamations I might hold you to them I hope you do well, for now, we should get ready. We don't want to miss the show. Oh, goodness, you're right. I'll call on you in a moment. I'll be here. Don't pity the spinster. You've no idea the life she's led, the love she holds so dear. Don't assume she's incomplete without the man she's yet to meet. It may seem she's on her own. That doesn't mean that she's Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, so I was hoping with this 
little brief interlude to to answer a a oft asked question of musical theater composers and lyricists of which comes first music or lyrics um and i feel like our truth is they come together but i think what's more importantly that comes first is text so we take a very dramaturgical approach to our crafting of musicals so like as you might have been able to tell from this sort of pistolary form of <laughs> that presentation um by Emily's been doing all sorts of incredible research into the history of the Alcotts. And um, by looking into the, the writings of Louisa the, the, and, and her letters with her sisters, the letters that fans wrote to the sisters, sort of addressing them to the characters in the book, um, Emily's been able to sort of piece together some, some uh, kind of the story behind the story. And I think in that uh, historical delving, um, that's where we really find um, our, our footing in, in developing stories because it's really, we we take it take so much from this uh, research based um, concentration, and uh, and that that really is, I think, principally what uh, informs our work. If anyone's curious, <laughs> all right. Yeah. What's next? Uh, well, next we have a, another number from uh, Miss March. Actually, the number immediately preceding this one. Well, scene in between, but the next musical number, um, and it is sung by May, who is the younger sister of Louisa and the. Uh, real life counterpart of Amy March. Um, and My hate. <laughs> Amy March is the worst sister and everyone knows it. We're not all Amy fans here, um, but you know, <laughs> something to explore in the show. Um, so with Louisa receiving the news that uh, Joe has to marry, um, May is tr trying to kind of explore what it means to be tied to the March sisters and how it reflects on them and how it impacts how they go through their lives. And so um, May is going to talk about herself and her art. Yes, George. And I'm just saying like, it means a lot coming from May when her basis was Amy. The fact that Louisa wrote a book and, and put May in as Amy is just, I think an unforgivable crime of a sister, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> what else to say about it? I'll have to tune into the show eventually to see if May thinks the same. Mm. <laughs> so, coming up now is more from Miss March. My first memories are from a cold and miserable night cornered by empty cupboards broken sink But through the dark I saw the most enchanting sight A pen A sheaf of paper And some ink We were always out of flour, beans and straw Without the tools a girl needs to draw I could sketch in the room what melt away To a dream of the life I'd live someday With an artist's eye to capture all I saw Everything I put myself through Everything I'm willing to do In spite of all the pain it may bring to my heart Leads me to a call I hear ringing loud and clear And something greater than me I see all the good that will come from my to make more than your little women ever dreamed every day i wake to create something striking and new cause it's true that their stories never were as real as they seemed so i'll prove to you there is just so much more i can do and i realize that i haven't made it yet a woman artist how peculiar is the only review i Sights are set. I can't let young Amy's path be my regret. I was meant to see more than that little woman ever might. Though your readers think we're the same, immature and naive, they perceive a reality we've always known is not right. So I must believe we can be so much more than the story of four imperfect girls in their prime, all of whom left. Can 
inspire us to be what men could not. Everything you put yourself through, everything you're willing to do, in spite of all the pain it may bring to your heart. When you face a choice like so for yourself or Joe, no, it's something greater than you. So do what you must for the sake of your heart. We've both always known what is best for our own. Guys, I was meant to do more than those little women ever could. There is not a word on a page that can change destiny.
<laughs> All right. <laughs> nice artistic, artistic rendering of Wonderland, the opening to Alice, which is a which is a, which is another musical. Um, I guess who? Um, and so the uh, yeah, so so rather like um, Little Women has some sort of connection to to the author. Uh, sorry, our Miss March, the musical, has connection to the author of Little Women, Louise May Alcott. Alice has obviously connection to Lewis Carroll, whose texts provide uh, most of the basis for um, the show. And um, sort of this idea came out of this uh, this idea of Lewis Carroll being, he was a little revolutionary as time for, in the fact that he wrote very directly for children. He wasn't writing to them in a, in a moralizing sort of way that a lot of children's stories kind of like had a very clear, like, this is the good character, this is the bad character. Lewis Carroll kind of, told the world, he made up a fantasy world that was fun for children, but it was also confusing in a lot of ways that the real world is. So we kind of see Lewis Carroll's um, books as kind of a, a warning to children about the perils of adulthood. Alice kind of gets to experience what growing up is like um, by running into all these rules that don't make sense and um, crazy characters. And so we've set this musical as uh, in, in Victorian London and Alice is this uh, young British woman who's just sort of coming of age uh, in a society that makes no sense and imposes all kinds of weird restrictions that really have um, no apparent point. Um, so it's divided into sequences, which are sort of stages of, of development, um, like education or, or coming out at a debutante ball. Um, and that opening was the first the first sequence, which is when she is still a child and she still has the freedom to dream and um, and 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 be in her be in her own mind and not be sort of constrained um, by her society. So um, we are going to the next number we're going to um, play you from Alice is um, called Courtship, and uh, like most of Alice, it is it, the text can be directly traced to uh, Lewis Carroll's books. So in Through the Looking Glass, Alice runs into the White Knight, a chess piece who recites her a poem. Um, and the and and this is sort of the basis of this scene courtship in which Alice is at a party. She meets a, she meets a young gentleman who is really shifty about why he's there, what he does for a living. And she sort of pries into who he is and sort of like pries into the, the status gap between the two of them. Um, in in a way that only Alice could manage. Um, and this features, again, the electrifying Rafe Gillum. So hold your hats, everyone. Um. <laughs> I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw a worn but gentle man a sitting on a gate. Who are you, holy man? I said, and how is it you live? His answer trickled through my head like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men who sail upon the stormy seas. A trifle, if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to tie one's whiskers green and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So if I ever try to go and find that sorry state, the effort will remind me so of that sad man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was feathered like a crow, who snorted like a buffalo, a sitting on a Having no reply to give to what the poor man said, I cried, come tell me how you live, and thumped him on his head till he said, I hunt for haddock size among the heather bright, and work them into waste cold bones in the silent and night. And these I do not sell for gold or coin of silvery shine. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on batter and go on from day to day, getting a little fat. So if a memory starts to show an evening warm and late, the longing will remind me so of that quaint man I used to know who rocked his 
body to and fro, and muttered mumblingly and low, as if his mouth were full of dough, sitting on the gate. I shook him well from side to side, until his face was blue. Come tell me how you live, I cried, and what is it you do? I I got my wealth. I thanked him much for telling me, but chiefly for the wish that he might drink my noble health. And now, if e'er by chance I put my fingers into boot, or madly squeeze a right hand foot into a left hand shoe, or if I drop a drop. with his bow that summer evening long ago. Some fact, fantastic editing on my part there. I just wanted to point that out. Um, that was that was very very beautiful, Emily and Ralph. Good job. <laughs> wow, well, fantastic playing. You know that was gorgeous. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I'm actually not here to say anything. Just Emily came on unexpectedly in the last uh, little interlude and just sort of sort of lurked there. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to mute myself to sort of lurk. <laughs> well, if it helps, I ducked out of courtship earlier, so you know. Trying to even it out. Um, so our next and final number on the program is uh, Banquet from Alice. Um, this is actually the party at which the white knight gentleman and Alice meet. Um, and it starts with Alice um, receiving uh, some, some dance lessons, you know, for when she eventually joins high society, she needs to be prepared for, for all of the etiquette and, and the and the affairs at these parties. And so she goes out for some dance lessons and a whole sequence ensues. So, oh, and I just want to uh, mention the uh, people who are in the performance, which was done uh, in our senior year at uh, Vassar, a senior project in music, um, the uh, first revival of Alice, if you will. Um, it features, of course, uh, George and myself, as well as our very talented friends, um, Bianca Berrigan. As the mock turtle. Yes, um, Helen Johnson. As the Red Queen. Sam Lovell. As the Footman. And of course, Rafe Gillum. <laughs> In the starring role of the Griffin. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, without any other delay, Banquet. Oh, my God. 
I, you know, as much as I love that sweet, sweet trumpet patch, it just doesn't compare to the real orchestra. So <laughs> I do miss, you know, I, I'm looking forward to when we can get back and blow deadly air particles through instruments around the same space, together, you know? That'd be great. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you again to the tank for having us. This has been so fun. It has been such a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to spend this hour here on Cyber Tank. Yeah, and of course, thank you to all of you who tuned in and are listening to um, to our works. We're so excited to share them, and um, we're uh, we're excited to keep making more. You know, ready for some more sleepless nights. Um, but you know, on that note, I mean. You ready to get some sleep? <laughs> <laughs>